Dear visitors of our European Heart Journal website, the My Cardio Interview Future, uh, feature, we are here in Davos at the Cardiology Update. Well, personally, my favorite Congress because it gives us the opportunity to meet the world leaders in our uh, specialty in cardiology. There are a lot of uh, what I would call the closest things we have to rock stars in our field here, and one of them. Uh, I have the pleasure to have with me today, it's Professor Messerly, and uh, we're going to talk, well, when he's around, about hypertension. Welcome, friends. Thank you, uh, Frank. I'm delighted to be here. And I have to say, it's my favorite Congress, too. Not necessarily because of the world leaders. You could meet them anywhere, anytime. But of course, there's also some skiing and some other items that makes this Congress exceedingly attractive. And yeah, nothing wrong with having some fun on the way. But why I'm mentioning the world leaders is one thing. Here they are, and you can ask them the questions we're always afraid to ask. And let's go to that. This is a year, 2013, which is going to be exciting in hypertension. There were years we probably thought hypertension was getting a little bit boring, but now it's getting more and more interesting. New drugs, new devices, and 2013 will be spectacularly interesting. Why is that, Brunson? Well, I think it's the year of the guidelines, and particularly the year of the American guidelines. As you may know, the latest guidelines we have now is JNC7, which is 2003. So JNC8 should be coming out. It's called JNC Wait, because it took so long. Um, but hopefully in May, it will see the light of the day. It will be published and presented at... For the time being, uh, the presentation should happen at ASH, the American Society of Hypertension. That's the latest plans I'm aware of. Well, you carry two hats. You're in Swiss and an American. So let's not forget our European guidelines that are coming this year as well, and that, that will be presented around the same time. Excellent. So we will have two brand new sets of guidelines. So let's go deeper and dig deeper here. So let's speculate on that. Before I ask that, a little question, the question I'm always afraid to ask. Do you take a blood pressure pill? I do. Which one? Well, consider. Uh, <laughs> consider. I actually take a combination of uh, two different antihypertensive drugs. Um, one is a calcium channel blocker, and the other is a blocker of the renin angiotensin system. A blocker of the renin angiotensin system. Let's hold that thought for a second. But we all, of course, thank you all, under the eminences in hypertension, our guidelines will reflect that view. If anyone knows the literature, you certainly do. Um, and the new guidelines, for me, will be spectacularly interesting in terms of the recommendation with regard to therapy. That's why I asked you the question. So here's a gentleman, one of the world leaders in hypertension, taking a calcium antagonist combination with a renin angiotensin blocker. Well, this is the only evidence we have in terms of morbidity and mortality from combination, isn't it? That's right, and it's the best evidence we have. When you look at the accomplished trial, Absolutely no question that their amlodipine did beat hydrochlorothiazide in reducing morbidity and mortality by 20% better. That is substantial. So amlodipine is a perfect partner. So, but who an accomplished that was benesipil and ACE inhibitor yep. with <clears throat> amlodipine and the other combination therapy, correct me if I'm wrong here, was ASCID, the first one of its kind. And of course, same thing, ACE inhibitor perinopil with amlodipine. So that's what you would do? You could, of course, make the point that in ASCID, the blood pressure lowering was not quite the same, particularly for the central blood pressure, with the atenolol arm and the amlodipine arm. So there may be a slight difference in terms of blood pressure lowering effects, but in accomplish with 24-hour ambulatory BP, exactly the same level of blood pressure was achieved. But in ASCID, in all fairness, that trial was stopped because of mortality benefit, which makes it only one of the three big trials. But in so it was accomplished. Exactly, uh, or which actually showed that mortality benefit. So, but once again, dig deeper, amlodipine, and which blocker of the renin angiotensin system are you are taking? Well, if you go by evidence, 
you know, you should take an ACE inhibitor, right? I mean, this is what accomplish shows. This is the trial that shows fixed combination of benazepil plus a bloodybine reduces morbidity and mortality. Now, I have to admit, I was on an ACE inhibitor at one time, and ever so slightly when I wake up in the morning, I had a, <coughs> not bad, but just kind of bothered me some, and I switched myself to an ARB, and this went away, and I'm doing perfectly fine on the ARB for the time being. But the evidence not clearly with them. The evidence is not as good as we have it with the ACE inhibitor. However, in the head-to-head -head comparison, as you know, uh, there was really very little difference between the two. That was a non-inferiority trial. That's correct. And that doesn't show equivalence. Is that correct? There you're right. Well, I'm, you know, probably more conservative than you are, but I personally think who wants, who did win, did win. And I think ask it and, and accomplish our, the trials that guide my, my therapy decision making. And I tell you, well, I, I personally would take an ACE and, and, and I'm loaded it. But it's not about me. We're asking you. So, uh, should the new guidelines highlight that then? I think the guidelines should hi highlight that actually, I would just say the combination of a dehydropyridine CCB and the RAS blocker seems to be beneficial. Um, if you want to be specific, and I think we should be specific, you should obviously mention where this evidence is coming from, right? Exactly. So CCB, amlodipine plus a renin angiotensin blocker, and if you want to be pure with the data, probably an ACE inhibitor. But, um, okay, so what about the most commonly used uh, combination partners? Uh, when you look at the marketing out there, they're favoring a lot of other drugs without any evidence. Is that right? There's a lot of out there and there's very little evidence. We have no evidence that the combination of an ACE inhibitor plus hydrochlorothiazide reduces morbidity and mortality. Which is exactly was the other arm in Accomplish. That's right. So what's your view, and we know it on, but would you please a little bit uh, explain that to us. Hydrochlorothiazide is so commonly used all over the world, that doesn't make it necessarily a good drug, right? It's the most commonly used uh, antihypertensive in the US and worldwide. In the US alone, we have 154 million prescriptions per year of hydrochlorothiazide in the dose of 12 and a half to 25 milligrams. And it's a lousy antihypertensive. So why is it then so often prescribed? I think it's a marketing issue. Exactly. It's a marketing issue. It's very simple, straightforward. So do you think, let's speculate then on the guidelines, will they have a statement on that then? You know, <laughs> if I could write the guidelines, no question that hydrochlorothiazide should be out and diuretics should be actually even clothalidone, second or third line, preferentially third line therapy. What about indepamide? Indepamide is very similar to clothalidone. There are fairly good outcome studies that we have with indepamide. And in head to head comparison against hydrochlorothiazide, distinct differences have been identified. So, yes, indepamide can also be used as a diuretic. But again, I would use it probably rather late in the game. So back to you, if uh, uh, your patient, Professor Messerly, is not adequately controlled, and uh, we come to in a second to what the target will be in a, in a few minutes, but uh, ACE inhibitor, calcium antagonist, or renin angiotensin blocker, calcium antagonist, the third drug would be? Would be probably a touch of clothalidone. Okay. Not much. Uh, you know, 12 and a half every other day can entirely do the job. And the old guidelines, the new guidelines will reiterate again that the third drug, if you need one, has to be a diuretic. Yes. But your statement is clear, rather, uh, rather clothalidone or indepamide, but forget hydrochlorothiazide. What would be your target blood pressure? Where would you go to? Um, that's a very good question and a very tough question to answer for the very simple reason. We have good evidence that if your blood pressure is 110 over 70, you are better off than the person whose blood pressure is 130 over 80. Yet, nobody has shown that lowering from 130 over 80 to 110 over 70 makes any difference. That has not been documented. What's the blood pressure at the moment? Um, it is somewhere around 115 over 70. That's pretty low. Um, so, and I feel fine, I do okay, I exercise, and I have absolutely no problems. So I see no reason to change that. Well, it 
my view would be uh, if you just go, are just below 140, you're just fine. Is that okay? Probably yes. Probably yes. I cannot provide evidence that uh, what I'm having is much better than the present time. Yeah, maybe we should have been less strict in the past. The same with diabetes and renal. We, we squeezed them down to 120 till they couldn't really stand up and properly. And that is really wrong. Exactly. We know that now for sure. Okay, that's great. You're, just some final words about the new devices. What's your take on uh, renal innovation therapy? Absolutely provocative, fascinating, looks good. But of course, you know, there are some thoughts. For instance, um, Grassi has shown quite some, Bianchi has shown quite some years ago, when you transplant hypertensive kidneys into normal tensive animals, and their kidneys are denervated, of course, by definition, they develop hypertension. So, you know, the whole pathophysiology behind renal denervation still needs to be elucidated clearly. But obviously, in resistant hypertension, it's a wonderful tool. If you had to guess, what, do you, what kind of level of recommendation will the new guidelines give them? A, a 1, a 2A? Absolutely not. Not in the US. Yeah. In Europe, perhaps, the yeah. guidelines will rate the evidence a bit higher. But in the US, I'm wondering whether it will be mentioned at all. I think with any new device, one should be careful, not overdo it. And it will be certainly uh, be a fantastic tool in the future, particularly for those with uh, difficult to treat, if not even resistant hypertension. That's great. We learned a lot, and that's something I will refer to. It's always important when you treat yourself. So Professor Messerly gave us some great insight how he's treating himself, a renin angiotensin blocker with a CCB, and the touch of clothalidone. And we are cardiologists. We don't treat hypertension isolation. Add a little bit of a statin. Which statin are you on? I'm not on the statin. That's I, but I have to say, my... HDL is over 100, so I'm, I'm not on the statin. The, the HDL would be any protective? Uh, well, we'll see. That's another one. <laughs> I think, once again, uh, fascinating. Franz is one of the persons I'd love to talk for an hour, and he has so much insight into really what's going on. And, um, and I think that we will be doing at the next Cardiology Update, Franz, again. Delighted, Frank. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you very much.